Yes, I'm Paul Higginbotham. I'm a developer on the PowerShell team. And what he's too humble to say is he's been doing a crazy amount of work on Jia and PowerShell security. True. Um, I'm Neil Holmes. I've been a developer on the PowerShell team since the first version. Wrote the PowerShell cookbook and uh, also did a lot of work on security. And now I do a lot of the security architecture work for Azure Management. So today we're going to talk about defending against PowerShell attacks. So how many people have to deal with a bunch of noise and stuff in, in their company where people are asking how do we start blocking and preventing and defending against all this PowerShell attacks? Let me hear you, let me tell you I hear it every single day. What we're first going to do is we're going to take a look down into the abyss that is the malware <laughs> ecosystem today. Because if you want to start talking about PowerShell attacks, well, what exactly do one of these things become? So kind of the, the traditional attacks, the things that come in, you've got phishing emails, you've got document macros, malicious website links, all that kind of stuff. So this is a regular old phishing email. Now, we tend to say, hey, guys, don't, don't get tricked by these phishing emails. They're pretty ridiculous. I was talking with a customer just last week, and it is absolutely no shame in getting tricked on one of these things. They had some partner sites and some partner regions get compromised, and what the attackers were doing were replying to active threads, like going to someone's email, replying to an active thread that says, oh, here's a follow-up on that, to another site. So then you got a trusted email coming with context of a thread that you've seen before, and now it has a document, they open it, and this is what they see. So of course, it was written in a newer version of Office, you click Enable Macros, and this is what lays behind. So this macro here is a great example of a very simple stage. It goes off to an internet website, Downloads an XC, and that, that XC is the actual bad stuff. It might be a, a megabyte or two megabytes of bad stuff. That gets downloaded to the, the active computer, and then gets invoked. Here's a more complicated one. No longer does this thing go off and pull an XC from a random untrusted site. Instead, the whole executable is embedded in this, this uh, BBA macro as a base64 blob. Then the macro, it sends it through a little bit of Windows command line tooling to convert that back into a regular XE. You see down at the bottom, it's calling an inbox tool to convert it out of base64. And then it runs that packaged XE. So you see here that the attackers who are running one of these, these attacks have full access to a very strong and robust scripting language. Here's another example. This is uh, actually a kind of a trial example, but real malware looks just like this. And this is kind of like the YOLO example of when people are doing malware. They just don't care. They'll just do whatever they want to do. So here's an example of a malicious attachment that downloads an XE, downloads a PowerShell script, downloads a BB script, downloads a batch file, runs it all. <laughs> They're like, you're not going to catch me anyways. You're not even looking. I'll do whatever I care. And then, at the very bottom, you see there's PowerShell-ExecutionPolicyBypass. So you've got all these AD vendors now who say, ah, we got a PowerShell attack, guys. we got to panic. These guys have figured out how to bypass all of our advanced techniques. we got a PowerShell attack. You better quake in your boots. So that's traditional PowerShell attacks. Like, this is legitimately it. Uh, a bunch of these were taken from John Lambert on Twitter. He does a great job of reverse engineering and showing the code behind tons and tons and tons of attacks that he's been pulling from virus flow. This is absolutely the staple of how people are getting in. But that's commodity malware. You might wonder, what does an APT look like? Like, what does the real, true evil look like? So FireEye, Mandiant, they do professional incident response. Here's an example of a blog post they did kind of recently where they said, 
we got a bunch of uh, malware going against the bank. What were the approaches that these guys were doing? When you take a look, and again, it started off as a phishing attack, ran some code, and if you take a look at the code that they ran, it looks just like the commodity malware stuff. It's the same stuff because it works so effectively. Uh, if you kind of down in this blog post, they do talk a little bit more about there is a little bit of power flow that they end up using, but it's basically the same stuff that you saw just, just before. So the AP industry will talk about this stuff as PowerShell attacks because they just literally can't keep up with everything else that exists. So Palo Alto, they've got an appliance that helps do email scanning and all that kind of stuff. They recently did an amazing investigation into 4,100 samples of where they saw malware using PowerShell, so PowerShell attacks. So this blog is out there. They even, uh, I asked them, I said, this is great data. Can you share this at all? Like the report itself is great. Can you share the samples? And within like an hour or two, they set up a GitHub with all their scripts, all the samples, all the package stuff. So like really, really good community participants. So they did an analysis. What was the initial point of entry for all of these PowerShell attacks? And they were investigating how PowerShell attacks were using the encoded command for the PowerShell. So you see here that 52% was literally an XE. That could have done anything, it could have been Mimikatz, could have been anything, and at some point it launched PowerShell. You've got a bunch of uh, Word docs, you've got a bunch of Excel spreadsheets, a DLL or two. So this was the result. Really the, the PowerShell attacks that they found were by, by far just regular stuff that the AV industry has been trying to block for many, many years and having a very, very tough time with. My turn. So PowerShell has never been used to compromise a machine. It's always been used as a post-exploitation post uh, tool. Um, and lately it's become a very popular post-exploitation tool. Um, it's popular with um, uh, security researchers, red teamers, blue teamers, um, malicious actors. And it's popular uh, all for the same reason. It's uh, very powerful and um, uh, it's easy to use. Does anybody here use PowerShell for like any sort of red teaming, blue teaming kind of stuff? Anybody involved in that security stuff? It's a great thing to get into, absolutely. So, so anyway, uh, an understandable response is, let's just block PowerShell. Um, but the problem is, um, PowerShell is only one of many ways to um, exploit a compromised machine. Um, if you're gonna block PowerShell, it's a little speed bump in the road. Uh, uh, you know, bad actors it may slow them down for a week or two as they refactor their code to use other other methods of uh, uh, of exploiting a machine that's been compromised. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, PowerShell, especially PowerShell version five, um, is by far the most secure and uh, security transparent. Uh, uh, management tool. So removing that from your, your tool set um, is actually making you probably less secure. One thing that's become increasingly clear is that PowerShell introduced 2006. Um, that is not day zero of when attacks started, right? Before 2006 it was, hey, VBA is the devil, or VB script is the devil, or Perl is the devil. Like there's always a scapegoat. And it's important to always focus on the underlying causes and not just on what's fashionable with attackers and script kitties and stuff nowadays. So one thing to keep in mind. You have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. So, well, just so we, like, maybe to help you make clear, what would it look like if PowerShell would have been the thing that, that they used to break in, right? Like, how would that have been different? Different than... So yeah, you're saying that you... Than a phishing attack or... So the question is, what, what actually would a real PowerShell attack look like? Um, and that would be an example of somebody uh, over email getting a, a .ps1 file, double-clicking it. Uh, you could argue that's 
And if a PowerShell attack, even though that's really truly a user running a thing attack, um, that's what happens, yeah. Uh, or another PowerShell attack would be if PowerShell remoting had a zero day in it where you just send it some evil packet and PowerShell started just running it. That would be an example of a, an actual PowerShell attack. Mm -hmm. The, the distinct, distinction between attack and a, an attacker using a user as a, like a marionette is very, very subtle, but in real life there's, uh, there's just never been a true PowerShell attack. Mm -hmm. That would be an example, yeah. yeah. PowerShell or is that a fucking remote? And I understand PowerShell that. remoting. I'm splitting hairs here, and I understand yeah. that, but, but PowerShell is using remoting yep. as, a, as a protocol layer. Yeah, and so that, that's a, a good example. Protocol layer, then hmm. yeah. you have a problem with the protocol. But that's ultimately, we still got to deal with the people who are saying, I got burned, the attacker used PowerShell, help me, right? So hmm. uh, hmm. blocking PowerShell.exe obviously is not the right thing to do. No, and in fact, uh, um, uh, PowerShell uh, as an automation engine um, isn't really connected to the to the host process, and PowerShell actually is just one of many possible host processes. Uh, PowerShell is really more connected to the uh, system.management.automation.dll, and of course that can be hosted in any PowerShell pro uh, uh, any uh, process, and in fact is you know like the IAC hosts PowerShell, uh, VS Code hosts PowerShell. There's exploit uh, kits like um, <clears throat> Um, um, PowerShell Empire does. PowerShell this, Empire, right? yeah, PS Attack. The PowerShell Empire, or the PowerShell Engine. Right. So you have to be careful uh, just thinking that, oh, I'm just going to uh, block PowerShell at XE and then, then I'm fine. But actually, PowerShell can be hosted in many, many ways. And these are just uh, just kind of illustrate uh, the fact that um, once a machine has been compromised, there are a lot of different ways that. Um, uh, the machine you can you can do post post exploitation work you, know, you can you can run code um, you can drop uh, you know binaries you can run different kinds of scripting languages you know you, PowerShell is one of them uh, HTML applications so that there's just a whole bunch of ways to do that. So there's no questions. Um, and then, you know, then there's popular uh, other popular scripting languages like you can Lua. Read that right. <laughs> yeah. So it's going to be a test afterwards. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but that are kind of considered safe, but is it really safe? Um, well, you know, if you can uh, run an executable, then no, it, it can be used as a po post-exploitation uh, tool. That was an example of Lua. It's a very, very popular embedded scripting language. You know, PowerShell's on the system, it's a scripting language. Lua is a scripting language embedded in hundreds and thousands of applications. And this is an example of Nmap. It's a very, very common security tool. Its embedded scripting language is Lua. With Lua, you could do anything that you could do evil on a machine, launch processes, all that kind of stuff. So uh, one kind of an interesting uh, uh, way to uh, uh, exploit a compromised machine is uh, just dropping binaries. Uh, and this one is particularly interesting because it was exposed uh, by somebody uh, hacking the CIA website. <clears throat> and it turns out that uh, one of the methods that CIA used um, to uh, collect data on machines is uh, basically replacing a DLL that the notepad++ plus plus uh, always loads. So every time Notepad++ plus plus runs, it loads this DLL. Um, CIA replaced it with their own DLL. Uh, and then um, you run Notepad++ plus plus and they're collecting uh, data off your machine. If there's ever been like software naivety, that's an example of it. When you think you could do a change log that says, I'm just going to fix the CIA hacking issue, uh, you got a bit to learn about the government. <laughs> okay, so you know all this was really talking about Maslow's hierarchy of security controls. We talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, you don't really want to be focusing on like, you know, making your chakras all nice and aligned when you can't get food, can't get water. What we so often see are people uh, getting attached to the news cycles and attached to the stuff they hear in the media, and they're like, oh, I hear about PowerShell is crazy, it's forensically clean, uh, all the attackers are using it, and then when, like, I don't want to like down talk to anybody, but then you know maybe their patching isn't in line. They don't even know what computers they have. 
what you want to really do is focus on the true attack at hand and say, well, you know, sure, they got in with PowerShell. Could they have got in with an XE? Could they have got in with any of the stuff that Paul just showed? Take the csc.exe, take arbitrary text, <coughs> compile it to an arbitrary XE and run it? Absolutely they could have. And so when people are asking you about blocking PowerShell attacks, you want to be starting to help them and talk through, sure, like let, that makes sense. Let's stop attacks and let's start thinking uh, holistically about how we do this. And the big point there is PowerShell, like what Paul mentioned, is we have invested fundamental tons of security in PowerShell since the very first edition. We, we listened, we learned, we talked to the VB script guys. They said, hey, we had a hard time of it. And so since the beginning, we've been focusing on what can we do to make PowerShell the most secure scripting language that exists. We really, really cranked this dial in PowerShell version 5 with all the logging and all that other kind of stuff. And so we also did, you know, we've taken a look at, well, no one ever talks about the danger of Python attacks. That must be because Python's awesome and has no security issues. It's no fault of Python, but it's got no security transparency. PHP, Perl, like what you really realize, if you just go and like flinch and start blocking PowerShell, what you've also done is totally curtailed the absolute most secure opportunity you have to manage your systems. The alternatives? Okay, I'm going to go back to VB script and RDP? I don't think so. This actually became a turning point. So the uh, Mandiant we talked about before, they had a great series of presentations recently called No Easy Breach. So they had a, an attacker, they were at a customer. An attacker had taken over tons of the infrastructure and, and this attacker was taking it over as pretty much as fast as they could remediate or investigate. And what they did, at some point they said, you know what, we're just going to upgrade PowerShell across the whole environment. They were using Python, PowerShell, VBScript, all this kind of stuff. They installed PowerShell, cranked the logging, and that whole operation essentially became open source. They were able to just start pulling these logs and see exactly what the attackers were doing exactly the scripts they were running, all the machines they were connecting to, and that became the breaking point that they could then use to start taking their investigation into its final days. So PowerShell actually does provide uh, a lot of security features, uh, and one of them is to uh, help sandbox or lock down PowerShell, and it's called Just Enough Administration GIA. So uh, a conversation that is probably typical. Uh, oh, by the so way, this, guy, this, this person here. <laughs> anybody recognize him? He's, he's not just some guy. He's not a hacker. Server. This is Benjamin Delphi. He wrote me McCats. Um, he's not actually personally evil. He doesn't break into servers, but his minions will do it for him. That's right. He's a security <laughs> researcher, but he looks, he looks evil. So anyway, <laughs> so, so we're using, we're using his likeness. Like Kyle Lester. <laughs> He's a nice guy. He's a good guy. So uh, a conversation I think was pretty typical is that uh, an arbitrary a person needs administrative access, right, to, to a machine. Um, and so they go to the owner, Jeffrey, and they say, oh, I want uh, admin access uh, through remote desktop because I need to go in. I need to restart the DNS uh, service. Uh, Jeffrey, not being born yesterday, <laughs> says, no, I'm not going to give you that, but I, you know, I will give you a PowerShell endpoint to connect to. So then the uh, administrator, uh, uh, random administrator uh, connects to it, is able to do his work. He can restart the uh, DNS uh, uh, service. Um, but that's all he can do. He can't uh, do other things that could you know, compromise the machine or be malicious. So the thing about uh, GEO, or just enough administration, is that... Um, uh, it's based on uh, PowerShell uh, remoting uh, endpoint configuration. Uh, actually, it's been around a while. You can uh, configure a remoting endpoint and restrict, um, you know, what that endpoint, what you can do on that endpoint, what commands you can see, what um, uh, language uh, mode you can run in, and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, we took it a step further in version five. We added this really cool feature where you can now restrict uh, what you do on a remote endpoint based on account roles. So, for example, if I connect to the endpoint as Paul Higginbotham, uh, my role is disk management. So, all I, all I can do on that is uh, run a handful of disk management um, commands. I can't um, 
poke around the file system. I can't get into the registry. I can't do anything like that. I can do my Has work and then get out. Have anybody poked around with Gia yet? Okay. Oh, good. Okay, so awesome. Lee, on the other hand, he uh, connects uh, to the same endpoint, um, but he's trusted, so he gets maybe full <laughs> access to, uh, uh, Bad to idea, the endpoint. Paul. Bad idea. Give me <laughs> calc and that's it. <laughs> okay. You got a question? Yeah, are there any best practices on how to set up these roles? Because obviously, you know, some people need a little bit more access, especially when you troubleshoot the system for operation. So, yeah, so the question is, are there best practices for setting up these roles? There are some blogs talking about that that actually is um, uh, uh, something that uh, can be a challenge to do it correctly. Um, I think there needs to be more of that uh, because because that is an issue when you set something up because what you do is you're starting with a really locked down I can't do anything on this endpoint and you want to carefully open it up just enough to allow people to do their work and you want to do that in a safe way in a secure way and that requires you know security reviews and that sort of thing. And, so and realistically, like pragmatic is best. Just like I don't care what you need to do. I'll say yes, and I'll put it into the JIA endpoint, no matter what it is. They say I need to like compromise AD, you're like, fine. I'll make a compromise AD function, and like you can run it. Because once you can get this down to like habit, measurable, then you can start talking about, well, sure, let's talk about refining <clears throat> these capabilities and whatever. The worst thing you could do is to say, we're going to set up a work group with like 1,400 people from across the company and make sure we've got synergies and all that kind of stuff, because you'll never get anywhere with that. Um, so anyway, yeah, so PowerShell, if you look at uh, 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 attack surface, you look at uh, two maybe axes, capability and time, it's got a pretty big attack surface. And that's by design. It's designed to be powerful and easy to use. Um, and so what we'd like to do is, is, is reduce that somehow. And, and of course, the first way you can is um, just in time administration. If you can narrow the time that you allow administrator access to uh, you know, a highly sensitive, high value machine, um, that reduces attack surface to a certain amount. Um, and then on the capability axis, uh, using Jia, if you can restrict uh, greatly you know, what they can do on the machine within that time, you know, then you further reduce that attack surface. And uh, just kind of a quick example here on how uh, you can do that. Uh, you create this capability you know, through a capability configuration file. And you say, these are the modules I'm going to use. This is a command list. This is a command list I'm going to provide. These are the functions I'm going to provide. Uh, and then when you put all that together and you get the intersection, um, you have a much smaller attack surface. Yeah, you go. Sure. So would one of the advantages would that be that you can make it so that people are notified when that level is used? So for example, yeah, one, one of the parts that wasn't in this example, but is part of the, the endpoint configuration is you can set up a startup script. So whenever somebody connects, you can run whatever PowerShell you want. These things can go off and send emails or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you have like, you know, the world is your oyster whenever anybody connects. So Gia is one of the things. Like, what what we want to get the point across is that talking to people like let's talk about strategies here isn't a way to deflect the the question about what to do against PowerShell attacks. Gia is to say the way you prevent PowerShell attacks is the way you prevent XE attacks and assembly attacks and X64 attacks and JavaScript attacks is by limiting who are unconstrained administrators on your machines. You know, it, these issues aren't landing on deaf ears. Another important point is the security transparency thing. People do need to use PowerShell, it's a great thing. What can you do that's part of your systems and part of your management that can turn, you know, this, this tool into one of your most useful sources of information. So one of the first ones is the module and pipeline logging. This is a thing that we introduced in the very first version of PowerShell. We made it configurable through group policy in version 3, and it logs every command and every parameter that's run on your system. When you enable this, you can forward all this stuff to your event management systems and say, hey, this guy these were the values that came into the parameters, and it's, it's all good. You get a great degree of detail. This, I think, is the key, actually, to start setting up some good GEO capabilities, where you turn on this logging for a while, mm -hmm. and then on the machines you say, hey, Joe ran these 14 command lists with these parameters, Susie ran these ones, and that's your good approach to start understanding how you can limit your stuff down. Um, 
then there's also transcripting. So that was the command logging is just what commands were run. Transcripting is kind of like the over the shoulder view. It shows the inputs and the outputs. You can even set these things and forward them onto remote machines. On those remote machines, you can control the, the ACLs on the shares so that if an attacker takes over the machine, they don't have this honeypot of amazing logs to read through. So that's a very useful thing. We also added deep engine logging. So every time you type a thing into PowerShell, or every time you run a script, there's a process that takes that big chunk of script and converts it into a PowerShell script block. That's, that PowerShell does that. Every time that happens, PowerShell ends up, you, you've got the option now to log this into the event log. This even includes the encoded command. This even includes when you use invoke expression. And this is a really common thing where somebody will say PowerShell uh, and then invoke expression. They'll pull a file from the internet and they'll have a hard-coded key that they'll go off and descramble it with. Send it back into PowerShell through invoke expression. And that becomes just regular, clean, visible PowerShell script. And that's what they run. Every single one of those stages were the ones that actually get logged into the PowerShell log. So this is what the group policy settings look like. So you see here that there's a bunch at the top for enabling transcripting, script block logging, module logging. And so this is where we've turned on script block logging. And if we take a look at the next one, um, so this is an example. Invoke Obfuscation is a toolkit that's come out recently. Uh, Daniel Bahannon has been doing a lot of work there to point out that people who are doing like raw string searches and logs are kind of, they've got a big gap because obfuscation like this is a very, very easy way to avoid all kinds of static string-based signatures. So he's been doing a lot of interesting work there. One of the first things he did, if we go back actually one, um, at the very top there, there's a, there's a fancy way of typing invoke expression. So this obfuscation is running invoke expression, and then it's just chewing up a string. And then when it gets to the PowerShell log itself, this is what you actually see. So this is a, a way more clarified version of that PowerShell, and it's absolutely the best deobfuscator money can buy. There are some attacks that you can do that even still make it complicated, but this is the kind of thing that, that ends up neutralizing tons of attacks. But you kind of see this stuff a lot when you're taking a look at what did the attackers do. Um, one of the things that people love so much about PowerShell is when you hear an attacker say, why do you love PowerShell? They go, oh, this is great. It's in memory only, it's forensically clean, nothing ever touches disk, it has full access to the .NET framework, and nobody knows what I did. What we've done in PowerShell version 5 with uh, platform support in Windows 10 is called the anti-malware scan interface. And so what I showed you before about that script block logging, every time PowerShell sees any new command text, well, it goes into the event log. But with anti-malware scan interface, it's also giving this to the installed AV engines. So every single time an attacker is doing this, PowerShell is saying, Hey, Defender, is this okay? Can I run this? Is this malicious? So that whole thing that everybody said was so amazing about PowerShell from an attack perspective is wiped out clean because every time they submit anything to the PowerShell engine, it first goes through AV. I've got a question. How can I catch that error of, the, of my antivirus is saying that it's, uh, it's cold? So the question is, how can you catch the error if the AV says it's malicious? the same way you do today with AV. So it's built into, there's, a, uh, I think, three vendors today who have latched on to the anti-malware scan interface. In Windows, it's an open interface. Anybody is allowed to participate in it and subscribe to it. The AV engine will say, uh, I detected malware. You get one of those little pop-ups at the bottom right, if that's the way they do things. They do something in their event log, if that's the way they do things. And then PowerShell just gets an uh, error code and it just says, this has been blocked by your antivirus application. So today, when you're detecting that malware has hit a workstation, you're doing that by monitoring event logs and stuff like that. You would do the, exactly the same thing, but now it's catching in-memory only attacks. 
And another interesting thing too is that traditional AV works by hooking the, the file APIs. It acts as a file system driver. Any application trying to access a file, AV just quickly goes and checks the file to see if it's bad before providing access to the application. That never worked with anything that used interactive PowerShell. It never worked when you had VB going out with the ActiveX you know, HTTP object and running eval on that stuff. Now it all does. Now there was a question. Uh, yep. Yeah, so the question is, if AV blocks it, how can I be smart about this stuff too? So like, the script block logging I showed before is a series of every single PowerShell command and every single PowerShell script that's invoked. As it goes through its layers of obfuscation and deobfuscation, you get a new entry for each one of the things that happens. Um, yes, it is, yep. So at some point, AV is gonna flag that says it's malicious, but what you got in your logs was actually every single stage. And I'm going to talk about a kind of a fun thing just like that too in a second. Um, you might say, if I get all of this, uh, I'll get to your question in a minute. Um, if I've got all this advanced logging, hey, doesn't this actually make me kind of dangerous for attackers? An attacker gets on the machine, all they need to do is look at my event logs and they'll see all of the content of all of the scripts I made. And so one of the things that PowerShell's done is added uh, protected event logging. And this builds on the magic of public and private key cryptography, where the idea there is the key that you use to protect data is different than the key that you use to like, decrypt it. So what you do here is you deploy the public key, which is your encryption key, to all the machines, all of them. You configure protected event logging, and this is what gets shown up in the event logs. It's just a bunch of encrypted text. An attacker takes over that computer, they can't see anything in there because they don't have that second part, which was the decryption key. Then what you have is all of this stuff being forwarded to your central collectors, and during post-processing before you dump it into your SEM, then you, that machine, that trusted machine, locked down, all that kind of stuff, it has a decryption key. So you're decrypting all this stuff and then dumping it into your SEM. So you don't have to worry about, about these, these logs becoming a source of vulnerability at all. I have one more question. So yes. if, I, if I sign up all my PowerShell scripts, can I uh, exclude all of signed PowerShell scripts from getting sent? Either? That's a really good question. It really is. Um, that's the thing that we've been looking So the question was, if I sign my scripts, can I kind of save my log volume and not have them go in? Um, not yet. One of the things that we've done very, very uh, in PowerShell is that Anything that's signed as part of the PowerShell product, so any inbox binaries and scripts and all that kind of stuff, those don't make it into the event log. And it would, would it be too difficult for us to add in that kind of control as well? We just haven't done it. So there's a bunch of event, event logs. You know, I talked a bunch about event logging. There's a good set of event logs to start to enable and log. Uh, the one thing I would point out is that the, the script block logging, so 4104, one of the things we've also tried to do there is make sure that, you know, we've done a big analysis of malware use in, in traditional ecosystem. So these are people who are doing things like invoking Mimikatz in memory, they're defining dynamic assemblies, they're doing a bunch of stuff in C Sharp and the .NET framework and injecting threads and shell code, like we've done that deep dive. All these things, we've put into PowerShell so that if it sees a script with any of that content, it logs it anyways. 
So even if you haven't got around to script lock logging or enabling it, we still have your back for the machines that you haven't. It's not the same thing as intrusion detection. Like, do not use this, this warning as an intrusion detection because it is possible for attackers to like mess around with script locks until it no longer shows up as a warning and then use that version. But it's, it's one of the things to say, oh, if a machine was compromised, at least there's a chance that you could get some sort of good data out of that. Now, one of the things we're talking a little bit before is uh, post-processing event logs, right? So one example of post-processing is decrypting them. So here is uh, another chunk of obfuscated PowerShell that came, comes out of invoke obfuscation. <coughs> this might look pretty scary. Uh, you might say, I have no hope in the world of ever writing a rule to detect anything bad in this. But one of the things that's made PowerShell really unique is how much energy we've spent making the PowerShell scripting language uh, introspection uh, capable. So you're probably aware of the AST, which is the, the structure that we let you extract out of the, the for loops and all those kind of stuff in the PowerShell scripting language. We've got the tokens that tell you all the command names and the parameters and the variables. All these things make PowerShell so much more open when it comes to security analysis than you could ever hope to get out of Python or Perl or anything else. So let's take a look at this guy. What would you do about obfuscation? Uh, one of the things you might notice is that the obfuscated text, it didn't look like a script I would have written. Like, if I saw this in an event log, I'd say, I'm in trouble. This is not a normal script. But how do you convert that, that gut feeling of this is not a normal script into something that's more actionable? Well, maybe one of the ways you say is like, that previous thing, it used like a lot of string concatenation, the pluses. It used a lot of brackets. It used a lot of other stuff. So here's an example of just doing some simple character frequency analysis on a PowerShell script. Now, one of the things that, that PowerShell script, that was a list of numbers. So the guys, the smart guys in the information retrieval space, they do stuff around like, you do a search, find all the documents that match stuff close to my search. That's called information retrieval. And they have this idea in documents called cosine similarity. So we don't need to work through the math, it's kind of stupid, but it looks kind of cool up there. But the idea is, when you've got two lists of numbers, you can tell how similar they are by running it through this formula. It's just like back in high school math of the angle between two lines. Well, this is just the angle between two lines with like a 45 dimensions. Now, don't need to understand this, don't need to read it, it's just an example again. But what this has been doing is taking those two lists of numbers. So we, had, uh, we did a big analysis against the PowerShell corpus that we've created, which is all the PowerShell we could find in uh, GitHub, TechNet, uh, PowerShell Gallery, all those kind of stuff. We did character frequency analysis against all of it. And then you compare it to obfuscated stuff, do some stuff there. Well, you can see here there's some similarities now, the stuff that is really obfuscated, uh, that is very dissimilar. So like 0 0.1, 0 0.3, very dissimilar from other PowerShell scripts compared to just some random other stuff we were doing some comparisons against. Now, when you graph that, so this is taking 3,500 scripts, running it through that obfuscation detection stuff, and graphing their similarity. And what you see here is that like almost everything is kind of like within 0 0.8. That's just like an average PowerShell script. By the way, guys, if, if any of you wrote a PowerShell script on the, on the gallery or TechNet or anything, like you're probably one of those dots up here. So like, take a bow. Thank you for your participation in research. <laughs> but you know, then you, say, you start to take a look. Out of 3,500 scripts, you're really taking, taking a look. If you wanted to investigate everything below 0 0.6, you're talking about a couple dozen scripts in like the corpus of all of PowerShell. Taking a look, which one of these are obfuscated, which one of these doesn't look like a real script. And turns out that the PowerShell gallery is like people like us, they like to see how short they can make a Christmas tree one-liner and stuff like that. So there's just a bunch of stuff that's not a normal, not a normal PowerShell script anyway. So this is a significant way 
to take the intelligence of, of PowerShell, the intelligence of you, and take this broad stream of data and bring it down to stuff that you can start to do some really advanced analysis on. Okay, so um, PowerShell is, you know, blocking PowerShell is not going to, you know, solve your security issue alone. You need a more holistic uh, approach to, uh, uh, to, to locking down your system. Uh, one way, of course, is blacklisting, uh, being able to identify um, XEs and uh, payloads that uh, are malicious, um, uh, that's like what uh, antiviral does, and then uh, blocking them from running. Uh, the problem with blacklisting, though, is that it's, it's pretty easy to get around. Um, you know, you, you just uh, rewrite your code a little bit or you recompile your code so that the signature is slightly different, and all of a sudden you're back in business. So really the, the, the right way to do... Um, you know, locking down your system and protecting your system is through application whitelisting. Um, and of course that's just, uh, you, you decide what you want to, to run on your machine, that's safe to run on, on your, 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 your high value machine, uh, and that's the only thing that you allow to run on that machine. Everything else is blacklisted by default. Uh, and then the nice thing is that PowerShell works really well with uh, systems, uh, uh, application white uh, listening solutions like AppLocker and DeviceGuard. DeviceGuard is, of course, the latest Microsoft uh, uh, application whitelisting uh, solution uh, in Windows uh, Server 2016. Um, so uh, kind of an example of how PowerShell plays with um, uh, uh, whitelisting solutions uh, is that uh, it detects that the system has been locked down. Uh, and so whenever you bring up an interactive PowerShell shell, uh, it runs, it's run in constrained language mode. And what constrained language mode is, is that it uh, uh, basically blocks um, elements of uh, the language that uh, can be abusive, uh, that can, uh, can be misused on the system. Uh, and that's for anything that you type at the command line, any script that you create at the command line, or any script that is not trusted, all runs in constrained language mode. However, a script uh, that, uh, uh, that you do trust, like say you want to be able to expose functionality that requires the full power of PowerShell, um, you can do that by making it a, a trusted script, and you can do that by having the script sign. And this is just kind of an example of that, where uh, uh, the, the script that's shown above is, uh, was uh, created and signed, and when you run the script, and it's, it's, it's accessing .NET classes, um, and it runs fine, but if you uh, type at the command line and you try to access .NET classes um, that are that are uh, restricted, then you get this error saying that uh, you know these these .NET types are, are not allowed in constrained language mode. Um, okay, so constrained language restrictions. Uh, what are they? They're actually fairly extensive, and there's going to be a blog that comes out. Um, hopefully fairly soon that goes into it in great detail. But in general, I mean, this is, it says it best here, that constrained language removes the language capabilities that, power, that makes PowerShell useful for attackers. And that basically means um, removing uh, elements that give you access to Win32 API, so comma objects, almost all the .NET uh, class types. Uh, there's a, uh, a set of whitelisted types that are allowed that just PowerShell requires. Uh, the add type commandlet, XAML-based workflows, all that sort of thing. Um, so that's all restricted, but uh, on the other hand, um, PowerShell is, is still available to run commands from the command line. You can, yeah, you have the language, you have if then else, for loops, all that stuff works. Um, so it's still uh, a useful uh, management tool, but it's been, uh, been constrained. So the important point also here is that constrained language doesn't make you attacker proof. What it still has is, at that point it's more like cmd.exe or bash or anything else. You can navigate around the system, modify files, run commandlets and stuff. So somebody can still format your hard drive when you're in constrained language. It's not the equivalent of like the local sandboxing like Gia is. Is there a question? Yeah, Well, you know, the, I, I understand, like, the, the question is, and the point of this presentation is that when you've got PowerShell, uh, you're trying to lock down PowerShell attacks, well, there's so many other attacks, 
At the same time, if you can say, this is super secure and super manageable, let's focus everything on that and move away from all this other crazy stuff. That's good. And just to be clear, the constraint language works best when it's in conjunction with app blocker, right. device guard, where you don't allow mm -hmm. CSC or the debuggers or all those other things. Right. You allow only the things that, that's what we're doing in, in uh, Azure Stack. We're saying, hey, these are only the things that should be running, and then we'll have a PowerShell. And so I, I guess we should just wrap it up. Yeah. You want to get the last one? Yeah, let's pass that one. Pass. So it took, took a little longer. <laughs> so, you know, the, the point here is that also be aware with all these PowerShell uh, enhancements, there's still the danger that somebody can downgrade to previous versions of PowerShell. So these, these decks are going to be shared and stuff.